affirmation of X and negation of X at the same time in the same way? And her response was, well, no, they weren't stupid. <laughs> I thought that was hysterical. That just still sticks out in my mind as such a funny moment. Oh my goodness, this is episode 100 of Patterson in Pursuit. Hooray! The milestone has been reached. I was thinking to myself, how to celebrate 100 episodes of Patterson in Pursuit? Hmm, maybe something like a retrospective. So I want to talk kind of about the show a little bit, maybe not from the purely intellectual perspective and talking about ideas, but rather what it's like to produce something like this. This has been an amazing opportunity for me personally. It's been an awesome journey. And I suppose before I even talk about it, I should give a gigantic thanks to everybody who has tuned into the show, who's listened, enjoyed it, shared it with a friend, who's left a review on iTunes, and especially all of the patrons of this show who have contributed their financial resources in support of what I'm doing. I'm just incredibly humbled. I'm so surprised that the way that I've decided to, to produce a show like this has worked. This is my own personal pursuit of truth that I'm doing for myself. I'm covering all kinds of abstract and esoteric topics that don't seem connected or related to most people and yet people are tuning in and enjoying the show so and contributing their money so just a, a huge thank you to everybody that's a fan of patterson the pursuit i've titled this episode trying to solve philosophy let me tell you why so several years ago now i decided all right as I started the intellectual pursuit, maybe with politics, I guess you could say maybe religious ideas before that, but I was interested in political theory. I realized politics and political theory actually imports a bunch of ideas from economics. Economics tells you about the world. And then I realized when researching economics, well, there's this fundamental set of presuppositions in economics about economic methodology. It's kind of more fundamental than economic conclusions is economic methodology. And the questions about how we go about gaining economic knowledge. And then, I thought, well, damn, this economic methodology stuff is presupposing a bunch of philosophical concepts about how we gain knowledge in general. What the hell is knowledge? What is the world made of? How do we know anything about it? So I got stuck on philosophy. I found my home in philosophy and I made a little bit of progress. I thought, I'm going to try to do this full time. Can I make this a career just writing and you know, producing videos? And I, then I got this idea for the podcast, just doing philosophy, which I think personally is the thing I need to sort out. If I'm going to understand the world, I got to sort all this stuff out for myself. And at, when I started, I in no way had the expectation that I was going to be able to make the kind of progress that I feel like I've been able to make to the point where now... I've seen very clearly that puzzles in philosophy are really hard, but they're solvable. Paradoxes can be really hard, but they're solvable. And really hard questions about like, what are universals? What are concepts? What are we? What is knowledge? How, how do we figure out anything about anything? All of these are hard, hard questions, but they're solvable. And I decided, okay, well, if I can solve some of these problems that seem to have perplexed people for a long time, and I have tools available to me that no other intellectual has had pretty much for all of history, namely the internet. I have access to the ultimate library that has ever been created on my cell phone. Nobody else has been able to have that kind of access to information. Hell, why don't I make the goal? I'm just going to try to solve philosophy. <laughs> so that's my new goal. To my satisfaction, I'm going to try to solve philosophy. I'm going to go as deep as I feel like I need to go, which for me is all the way. I, th I think I've gone all the way down to the foundations, which you can read about in my book, Square One, The Foundations of Knowledge, which is about logic and the relationship between logic and existence. And I'm building from there. And my new goal is to solve philosophy. It's utterly preposterous, but I'm going to try to give it a go. And I figured... My audience has enjoyed my own pursuit of truth through this uh, show. So why don't I just keep doing what I'm doing in articles and uh, through the podcast and maybe and through future books, get as far as I can get, and I bet people will appreciate it. Even if I fall short, even if I'm totally confused about everything, I'm very confident that people will appreciate the attempt. 
So that is why the show has the most preposterous title ever, which is that I'm trying to solve philosophy because I am. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the stuff I'm doing right now and um, what I'll be doing in the future. And then I want to share some of the crazy experiences that I've, I've had producing this, especially when I was traveling around. So just really cool stories that I, I, don't, I don't think I've shared on this show that you guys might enjoy. And also, I would say the conversation that I consider most impactful for my own personal um, philosophical journey. I've had all these awesome conversations. They've you know, enriched my understanding of the world and philosophy, and I love having them. There's one conversation I had in particular that I can look back and say, okay, that really laid the foundation for my own personal you know, philosophical breakthrough. I have a particular metaphysics I think is pretty rigorous and pretty good, and some of the foundations were laid or put into place by this conversation I had, um, and I guarantee nobody could guess what this conversation was because it's like my least one of my least popular episodes, probably very boring to listen to. It was just for me at that time, the the it just hit all the right buttons, put a lot of things into place, and I'm like, oh damn, this uh this is. This was really valuable for me. So I'll tell you what that is later. All right, so, so a couple of things that I'm, I'm working on right now. I know I've brought it up a few times on the show, and it's, kind of, it's always awkward to talk about in public, but I have learned over the past especially eight, eight to ten years now that if you want to uh, pursue truth and you want to pursue deep human fulfillment, you got to have health. I mean, oh, my gosh, it's a long, long story, but... You, you, you can't have a healthy mind if you don't have a healthy body uh, in general. You can't have f fulfillment. You can't accomplish the goals you want to accomplish if you don't have health. I was reading uh, Arthur Schopenhauer the other day, and uh, he's got a line in there where he says something like, you know, happiness is 90% health. It's 10% other things. And that might be true. I didn't know that prior to losing it. We have a, my, my wife and I have a, kind of a long story of our health being an issue and then degrading and degrading and degrading and getting to a point of emergency where we're, we're out of that now, which is good. Um, but that's very clear that health it really needs to be um, number one in probably most people's lives, even if they don't realize it. Fortunately, uh, though this journey has been very difficult along that front, uh, my wife, Julia, has been doing extraordinary research, just an incredible amount of research and has is putting together a theory that I find eminently plausible and uh, it has helped us um, recover our health and or not to the point yet where I I'm confident in saying you know, this is the way the world works this is what we did and it fixed us this is what you can do it'll it'll, it'll help you if you're having health problems um, I just want to you know I want to have really high epistemic standards um, but it looks like this is the direction we're heading um, to hopefully solving some of these problems. And whenever that is the case, and we both feel like, okay, we're actually fixed, and we have a theory that's attached with it, then um, you know, 100% promise we're, we're talking about it on this show. And probably going to be talking about it to our, to our friends and our family and bothering people because it's such a big deal. But we just want to wait until we're really confident before coming out with it. So this is also one of the reasons why, you know, this, my production has been so sporadic for quite a long time now is just the health stuff goes in waves. But thing, I'm still very optimistic and um, I'm excited because um, the, the episode that, I think I've done one episode on health where Julia and I spoke about a little bit of our story and I got a ton of feedback from people saying, wow, this is really valuable. Thanks so much for sharing this. Can you share more information? So I know there's a bunch of people out there that are, that are hurting that want high quality knowledge in this area and I can't wait to deliver that um, when it's ready. How far can you get in the world of ideas outside of the academy in the modern world? And I think I have enough evidence to say you can get pretty damn far and you can, you can do, you can have a, a life of the mind that may be even superior to people that are stuck within the academy, maybe even way, way, way superior. So this is, I've, I've spoken very highly of the internet before, internet technology being amazing for independent researchers, just total game changer, probably 
more important than the printing press in terms of the access to information that anybody can have just if they have an internet connection. And I want to paint a picture for anybody that is interested in doing a project like this, either doing a podcast or start writing and putting their ideas out there or starting a YouTube channel, where I, I want to give some encouragement that if you can find a way to communicate effectively and earnestly, people, if people believe that you're being sincere and you have the ability to communicate rather clearly, if you put it out there, people are going to enjoy it. People are going to gain value from it. Even if you're totally wrong about something, but you can clearly write about your wrong ideas, and then you change your mind, and you can explain exactly why you think your ideas were wrong, blah, 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 people are going to find value in that. Even if maybe you're a little bit shy, or you have some ideas that you think are kind of wonky and way out there, if you can communicate it earnestly, then people will be able to see your perspective and appreciate that perspective, even if they disagree with it. And I know from my show, like I, I, I get feedback from people, and I know some people don't like when I talk about politics. Some people, I get messages when I talk about Bitcoin. Why are you talking about Bitcoin? I thought this was a philosophy show. I get plenty of people who say, Steve, I'm with you on a lot of the philosophy. When you dive into the philosophy of mathematics, I tune out. But you know what? Those are the edge cases. There are the vast majority of people appreciate that this is the, the, a, a pure pursuit of truth that I'm just trying to record. And this is not unique to me. If you guys are passionate about something or many things, or it's, it's a mixture of you know, research and economics with the philosophy of math with whatever, biology, whatever you're interested in, package, if you can package the content together in a way that's interesting to you and you communicate in a way that you wish other people could communicate, then you can find an audience. This is not something I knew before going into it, right? Especially when you think about how preposterous it is that I'm just some guy on the internet, right? I've got some, some bachelor's degree from, you know, some nothing school. And then I, I talk about really esoteric topics with a ton of people that are in the academy at various levels of prestige. The whole thing works. Turns out people, <laughs> turns out people that care about ideas fundamentally aren't obsessed with credentials. And if, if, you don't, if you don't have credentials and you're worried people are going to dismiss you because you don't have the credentials, well, the people that are going to dismiss you aren't really thinking people anyway. The thinking people, even those in, stuck inside the academy, don't really care about your credentials. And I have living proof of that being the case. So I hope you guys find that encouraging. It certainly was encouraging and surprising to me. I also want to share a perspective of Patterson Pursuit that I know I've shared publicly, but I, I don't think I have off specifically on the show, which is part of the motivation for this. Well, there's many motivations for doing the show. Um, one of them is not so nice. It's a little bit, mm, a little bit mean. And it is both to record conversations that I'm having in my own personal pursuit of truth and to record ideas coming from the mouths of academics that are very poor. So I want there to be proof that some really, really bad ideas are articulated and believed at the highest level of the modern academy. I have an explicit goal, which is to mm, reveal the truth about the modern academy, which I believe we're stuck in something like a dark age, largely because of the dogmatism and bad incentive structure of the modern academy. So by having some of these conversations with people who say utterly ridiculous things, I, I am trying to make a point to people that are thinking through these ideas that, oh, maybe not everything that's coming out of the academy is good. Maybe if you have a PhD, it doesn't mean you're even remotely knowledgeable, even about your own subject matter, because you may have overlooked the fundamentals of your subject matter. So I don't want to, of course, name names, but if you go through the list of people that I've interviewed, you will find some set of interviews in which the person is making a horrible case for terrible ideas and revealing uh, and or revealing a profound lack of research and thinking about the um, ideas that they're talking about. And so part of what I wanted to do from the beginning with Patterson Pursuit is have a record of this, um, which I recognize is not very nice, <laughs> but uh, so be it. I, I have a particular goal to, re to reveal the state of the modern academy, and this is one way of me trying to accomplish that goal. Okay, so before talking about some of the interesting experiences I, 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 I've been able to have thanks to the show. I wanted to discuss just a little bit of the ideas that kind of stuck out in my mind. Let's say the positive ideas 
Um, and then I'll, I'll share with you this one conversation I had that really set me up for, um, for, a, for a paradigm shift for me. I and mean, there's been many just excellent points that have been brought up when I've been able to talk with these people. And I mean, it, there's way too many to bring up, but uh, I found a handful really stuck out to me that were, that were pretty important. One of them I thought was a really cool moment was right at the beginning of the show. It was like episode two or three where I got to talk with Dr. Westacott, who was uh, a philosophy professor, professor at my alma mater. I only took, you know, a couple of philosophy classes while I was there, and he was the instructor for one of them. But I actually, he and I got along really well. He, at the time, he was just a complete relativist, 100% all truth is a relative. You can't know anything with certainty. And so what I wanted to do to start the Patterson Pursuit was to talk with him because I liked him, but I knew he and I completely disagreed about the fundamentals of things, and I thought it would be great It'd be kind of great in the pursuit of truth to start the pursuit off with a professor saying that you can't have access to truth. But I was totally shocked because in, when I had that conversation with him, he actually had changed his mind from the time that I was there when I went, went to school to when I interviewed him for the show. He changed his mind about some fundamental ideas that my respect for him just went through the roof when we had this conversation where he, he, was a, he was a relativist for, I don't know, 40 years, something like that, 30, 20, 40 years, and then for some reason decided, actually, you know, I think we can have access to certain truth, like the fact of my consciousness existing. Like there is at least consciousness in the universe. I know that. I have direct certain experience of that that's good then maybe that's a bedrock or a foundation that you can build on and he shared that i was like wow that's so cool i was not expecting that i have such a low opinion of so many academics especially relativists uh but he changed his mind so i don't know i just thought right at the beginning that was um that was just a really cool moment for personally, just because I knew him. Um, and then, you know, intellectually, it was so cool to see somebody change their mind after decades of believing the same thing about a very fundamental issue. There's also this wonderful line that I remember um, when I went, when I was talking to Janet Gyatso. I, remember, I think she was at Harvard. I don't quite, yeah, I believe she was at Harvard. She was one of the Harvard interviews. And we were talking about Buddhism um, because, you know, a, a running theme in the show has been can you have access to any certain truths? And another way of, approaching it is, are there any real contradictions in the world? Can you have true contradictions? And, you know, whenever you talk to people about contradictions and this type of thing, um, a, a lot of times people will invoke ideas in quantum mechanics or vague ideas in the philosophy of mathematics. Sometimes they'll get into like um, Buddhism, will come up with like the Zen cones sound contradictory and yet they're true. So maybe they're contradictions. And anyway, there was this wonderful line where we were talking about contradictions in Buddhism. And I was trying to say, like, specifically, I know these paradoxes sound contradictory, but are they taking them in the literal sense, like affirmation of X and negation of X at the same time in the same way? And her response was, well, no, they weren't stupid. <laughs> I thought that was hysterical. It just still sticks out in my mind as such a funny moment because I was like, oh. Oh, well that, well, that makes sense <laughs> because I had expected, you know, there's a lot of mush that you get when people invoke Eastern philosophy, let's say, kind of a mushy thinking. And so to hear somebody who was, you know, who had been researching that was teaching at you know, Harvard, some of these concepts to be like, oh no, of course they didn't think there were true contradictions in the literal sense because they weren't stupid. I just thought that was delightful. <laughs> Another interesting moment that happened uh, or a conversation was at Oxford with Timothy Williamson. Um, I'll tell you a funny story about him too after I'm done talking about the ideas where I thought this was really revealing. We were talking about logic and I guess a similar topic, can you know anything with certainty? We were talking about the law of identity and can you be certain at least in the law of identity that things are the way that they are and by extension they aren't the way that they aren't. And what's interesting about Williamson is he's this classical logician that you know, very strong strongly makes the case for, let's call it Aristotelian logic. It's not the most correct way of putting it, but let's, let's call it that. Um, so I had assumed that he was going to be a defender of the idea that, of course, you can be certain in the law of identity. Because, I mean, he's kind of articulated this just not with regards to certainty, but with how fundamental logic is. And he, he said something along the lines of, I don't think it would be a, the right disposition for a philosopher to claim certainty, even about the law of identity. This is a really interesting insight where 
And for me, I kind of read between the lines when, where he's saying, yes, of course, you can be certain in it, uh, of it, but you can't say it publicly because it's, I, it's a mixture of bad manners. Right? You don't want to sound dogmatic. And also, it's something like we have a rule of thumb principle for what is dangerous patterns of reasoning, unreliable, dogmatic patterns of reasoning, and what are rigorous and open-minded patterns of reasoning. And talking about certainty automatically puts you in the camp of dogmatic patterns of reasoning. And so even if we have some candidates for certainty, uh, we can't really accept that they are certain because that would just be like bad form. It's like a bad principle to be certain about anything. I just thought that was fascinating. And I mean, I disagree with him. I think it's yeah, I, I definitely disagree with them. I think it's a big deal. Um, but that was another moment that kind of sticks out in my mind as gaining some information, not as much about the world of ideas, as, as so much as maybe a, a glimpse into the psychology and reasoning process, meta reasoning process, social reasoning process of a pro professional philosopher at a very high level who is taking into consideration things like, you know, what is what what is essentially good philosophical manners rather than what is true and what is false. <clears throat> All right, the last set of interviews that I want to talk about before I, I tell you the one that really affected my thinking um, is the philosophy of mathematics interviews. So I was completely flabbergasted several years ago when diving into the foundations of math to see the shoddy reasoning that lay at the heart of the foundations of mathematics that was set there a little bit more than a century ago. Around the turn of the 20th century, you had a foundational crisis in mathematics that was re never resolved, and the working resolution was garbage from a philosophical perspective, and it never quite corrected itself. This was, I could never have believed in a million years that would have happened in mathematics of all disciplines, but it did, and uh, those problems have not yet been fixed. So it's difficult to be a guy working outside the academy and across multiple disciplines to come to some of these conclusions and state them publicly because it sounds like crankery. And, um, and there definitely is a correlation between true crankery and really bad mathematical ideas. Occasionally I'll get emails from people that are definitely cranks. And a lot of times, I actually had an, an email from a guy not that long ago, and it, and it opened up, you know, hi, Steve, um, next sentence. My friends call me the greatest mathematician ever. And then he talked about some crappy mathematical ideas that had nothing to do with the stuff that I'm interested in. <laughs> but uh, I, I Googled his name, and um, he's like a, a well-known, genuine math uh, crank. But anyway, so it's this dicey thing to talk about, especially when you talk about the foundations of math, because people think, oh, are you claiming arithmetic is broken? And it's like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not claiming arithmetic is broken. It's the foundations of higher math. But anyway... Um, when I've been researching this, I, I see that the paradigm in which we live is one which imports a bunch of ideas from the philosophy of mathematics and the philosophy of physics and science. Um, and some of those ideas are wrong. And so in the process of creating a new paradigm, uh, a new completely different worldview and coherent philosophy, which is my goal for myself and something that I'm going to be doing professionally and for other people, um, I know that a lot of work has to be done in the philosophy of math. And I see particular areas that need to be fixed. The concepts surrounding infinity need to be fixed, and assumptions about Platonism need to be fixed. Those are two big ones that cause a whole range of big problems. Uh, but this was distressing, because I'll just, without going into detail, if it's the case that there are no actualized infinities, then it is the case that space is discrete. If it's the case that space is discrete, well, that breaks a lot of math, uh, a whole bunch of issues. If you think about if space is discrete, then suddenly the, such a simple phenomena as rotation suddenly becomes very complex. It's like, what the heck is happening if space is discrete and something is rotating? It's like breaking. And you, you need like a new math of discrete space, which means you need a kind of a new math because Euclidean geometry is built on the concept of continuous space. And it's not, that's a big project and something that I know needs to be done. And it's not something that I'm I bet it was overly enthusiastic about doing personally. I figured, I thought, okay, well, somebody's got to do it. It might as well be me because I don't see anybody else working on this. So I made a little bit of progress in this area. And then I stumbled, somebody uh, shared, uh, I think it was just a listener, shared the work of Norman Weilberger. And I was talking about infinity stuff. And I was like, who is Norman Weilberger? Long story short, there is a professional mathematician in the University of New South Wales in Australia who is developing 
mathematics from new sounder foundations. And he's brilliant. He's unquestionably a genius. He's got the most mathematical knowledge by far of anybody I've ever uh, heard uh, across a whole range of issues. Um, I got to interview him, and that was exciting. I went out there to Australia kind of for the purpose of, of interviewing him and talking with him. And it's brilliant. He's done a bunch of brilliant things in math. And he wouldn't even himself see it this way, but I see it this way. He has actually developed a mathematical theory that Einstein was looking for. <laughs> uh, it's, you could call it even a theory of finite space. He wouldn't put it that way. But I see his math in a different way than he sees his math. I see what he's doing as being... Uh, truly revolutionary, fundamentally. And boy, it's well overdue. It's overdue by more than a century. I say it's what Einstein was looking for because, as just another aside, um, Einstein was one of those people who actually seemed to be like a thinking person. And there's a lot of people in popular culture that are considered to be you know, just unquestionable geniuses and thinking people. I don't, a lot of them I don't think they were. Einstein seemed to be one of them. He seemed to be aware of the process of theorizing carefully. And uh, there's a line, there, there's, a, there's a back and forth he has with, I believe, Schrodinger, who's another popular physicist, where they're talking about this idea of continuous space. And it's a central concept in his theory of relativity. And he says, essentially, I consider it a real possibility that the whole idea of continuous space is wrong. And if that's the case, then relativity is essentially a castle in the sky. But we don't have the math yet to have a theory of discrete space. That's a summarization. And uh, so they just went with this, of course, relatively became a rel relatively, popular, uh, relatively popular theory. <clears throat> um, but I think Weilberger has done it. And I'm, I, I think it's a huge deal. And so to be able to talk to the various people on my show about the philosophy of math having to do with infinities, and I got to talk with Weilberger and Zeilberger, I am totally convinced that in the next 30 years or so, we are going to see a massive shift in the philosophy of mathematics to ideas that are more aligned with Dr. Weilberger. And I think it's going to spill over into physics because there's, there are other researchers that are um, working on a theory called loop quantum gravity that have the assumption of space and time being fundamentally discrete, which they are, um, and it's going to solve a bunch of problems. So this, that, this whole area of me pursuing the philosophy of math on the show has been awesome just for me developing my own ideas, especially at, you know, they become more and more sophisticated uh, lately, but Part of the reason I dive deeper and deeper into this is because on the show, when I talk to these people, it's very clear to me there is room for new thinking here. This is not, there's so much dogma around mathematics that this is one of those areas where you can, you can get a lot of unique, fresh contributions. Um, so naturally, I'm attracted to that. So even if you guys haven't been enjoying the philosophy of math tough, I certainly have, and, it, and I guarantee it's going to be a gigantic deal for the next, the next uh, paradigm shift whenever that takes place. Okay, so I want to tell you about this conversation that I had. Um, and in fact, I should, I should give a special shout out to uh, Bernardo Castro, because though I wouldn't say his, the conversations I had with him were so impactful as the one that I'll describe, um, I do think some of the highest level conversations I've, I've been able to have on the show are with Castro. I think he's brilliant intellectual. I disagree with him, but um, I think the work he's doing is, is very high quality, and I love that he's doing some of it's inside the academy, some of it is outside of the academy. Um, that is a, a thinking person, so shout out to Bernardo. Okay, so... I had this conversation at Tufts University. This is episode 37. And uh, it, we, it's with Dr. Mario DeCaro, who's an Italian philosopher. Some of the conversation was boring, even for me, but there was a little bit in there when we were talking about metaphysical pluralism. And he presented a, a point that I hadn't really thought about that just which set things up for my current philosophy. And the idea is this, that if we're just being honest in our observations about the world, then it, and we don't try to immediately come up with some theory to put everything, all the objects inside of a theory, it seems like there are different categories of existence. You have physical things, you have things that take up space, 
Uh, this is thing that are spatially extended, like this pen here. But you also have something like, you know, experience. You have, you have the experience of color. Your consciousness is not something that itself seems to take up space. It seems maybe you could be aware of the taking up of space, but it itself is not uh, taking up of space. You can also talk about abstract things. It seems like relations. You can talk about spatial relations as existing. And the metaphysics, let's just not comment on the metaphysics, but they, it seems to be that there are things, you know, the, the right half of the pin is spatially extended, the left half of the pin is spatially extended, and there's a particular relation between the right half of the pin and the left half of the pin. That relation seems to exist. I mean, if I, if I push down on this part of the pin, the other end of the pin lifts up, right? There seems to be some interconnectedness between these two things. And yet the relation itself is not spatially extended. So that seems like another type of thing. You've got physical objects, you've got maybe abstract objects, you've got consciousness. Um, then you can even talk about uh, biological things. It seems like um, you've got rocks and then you've got living organisms and they seem to op there seems to be something uniquely different there. It's not so clear that you can just reduce living things down to uh, non-living parts. There's an interesting question, an interesting composition question there. So that's the base level observation. I think that's true. Yes, there seems to be many, 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 many different types of things. And he was saying, well, why not then just... Uh, acknowledge that a, that a metaphysical pluralism makes a lot of sense. Why are we trying to collapse everything down to one ontological category? Maybe we don't need to do that. Maybe in the, in the biggest picture sense, we can say everything exists, therefore it's all in the biggest possible category of things that exist. But if you're going to get more specific, like there are really distinct ontological di differences between things. It's not just that it appears that way and it's some problem. It just it appears that way because it is that way. There actually are meaningfully different ontological categories. The only problem, really, with this theory, from a, from, a, from a kind of a theoretical, metaphysical, philosophical perspective, is the problem of interaction. If it's the case that reality comes in a bunch of different categories, you need fundamentally different categories, then how do they interrelate with one another? Because it seems like there's some type of relationship with the blueness and the spatial extension of the pin, right? They have some relation with one another. It seems like there is some type of relationship between living things and non-living things. So how do they interact? And obviously, the mind and the world seem to interact, but how? So you've got, it comes down to the, the problem that Descartes faced in his Cartesian dualism, which is, okay, if, if we have these ontologically distinct categories, how could they even, in principle, interact? And so I'm looking at that. So, so that, that was very powerful for me because I'm like, hey, that's a pretty damn good argument. So from the abstract perspective, I'm thinking, all right, well, if it were possible to solve this interaction problem, boy, that would pretty much solve a ton of other metaphysical problems because then you could just be a pluralist. You know, there's a bunch of different types of things and they interact. You just got to come up with some mechanism of interact, mechanism of interaction. If there's any conceivable way that we can come up with a picture of how objects in multiple ontological categories can interact, then we've gone off, and then we solved a bunch of philosophical issues for good, maybe. And so at the time, I didn't obviously didn't have an answer to the interaction problem, right? That hasn't been able to be solved by dualists or anybody else that I have seen, you know, for a few centuries. So, but that seed was planted. If we can get to pluralism, ooh, that is attractive. That seed was planted years ago now, whenever I had that interview. And sure enough, I don't know when it was, when I was living in South Carolina, I was in the bathtub. And I was thinking about the discreteness of time. And if time is discrete, then it's, um, you know, it's like, there's an instant, and then there's another instant, and another instant of reality. It's like the, like a snapshot picture of reality. It's a pr progression of, of moments with no time in between them. You could think of it like a film reel. Maybe you're looking at it. It's like, here's an instant, here's an instant, here's an instant. Things are in different states across the different points in time. There is no, it's not continuous in the sense that there are always um, additional states in between two states. You actually have two kind of side-by-side -side states. So I was thinking about this, and then suddenly it just popped popped in my head, um, my attempt at an answer for the interaction problem, which I wrote about, if you guys are interested, it's called mind-body dualism. Uh, I, think, I think I called it a theory of indirect interaction, uh, or, or maybe solving the interaction problem. I forgot the title, but you can find it on my website. I, I wrote it somewhat recently, um, where I was like, oh, if, if reality comes in these discrete states, 
then it here is a possible mechanism whereby you could get mental states affecting physical states, physical states affecting mental states. At the very least, you could you could have an effective interaction between. It could be even epiphenomenal, where you have one-way interaction from physical states to mental states, but they are states in distinct ontological categories, and yet you still have a real causal relation between them. And uh, that, for me, was just a gigantic breakthrough. And maybe for other people, it'll be a breakthrough too. We'll see. Uh, I think it's a pretty big deal. Um, and this is something I'm totally convinced of now. I'm, I'm firmly a metaphysical pluralist because I have at least one um, plausible theory of interaction. I, I call it effective interaction or, or indirect interaction. It's not direct interaction, it's indirect interaction. So actually that little seed that I had planted um, was partly due to this converse, this boring ass conversation that I had with uh, Dr. Mario Dakar, episode 37. How about that? All right, so I want to finish up this podcast by talking about just a couple of experiences that I've had that you guys might think are really funny. And especially if you kind of know my background before starting this show, let's say it's a somewhat humble background, the idea that these experiences took place is hysterical. It's just hysterical to me, and it's cool, and maybe it'll be exciting and or encouraging to you. So um, one of them was just a really amazing moment. I'm glad I got to share. I got to share with my wife, Julia, too, which is when we were in New Zealand. And uh, I, there's a, there was a professor there. I believe his name is Dr. Patrick Gerard. I forget what episode it was, but um, he had done some work in uh, in logic. And he was a guy, it was like a dialetheist, somebody that thought there were logical contradictions. It's been a running theme on the show investigating this idea. But So I, I emailed him. I said, hey, you know, would you like to talk about these ideas on the show? He said, oh, yeah, but I'm currently on vacation um, and with his in-law or whatever, somebody in his family. He's like, oh, we're, we're, we're outside of Auckland. I don't exactly remember where it was. It was, uh, I mean, maybe it was farther down. Anyway, he said, why don't you come up to our, to our farm and we can talk about it up here to, our, to, to my you know, sister-in-law's estate or whatever it was. And I was like, mm, okay, <laughs> that sounds like fun. So Julia and I end up uh, getting a rental and driving to this unbelievably gorgeous estate in the middle of New Zealand from I don't know what his his uh, relative or did, but they were very well off and they had like it was a gigantic property. They had a bunch of farm animals. They had an infinity pool, and it was this really cool moment. I remember this. Julie has footage of it. I don't know if it's on one of the behind the scenes footage. It, it might be, but it was this really cool moment where um, Dr. Gerard and I were having our conversation in this gazebo, and there's like there's this vid visual footage of you know the mountains in the background these beautiful plains there's like a pool there and you can't hear um dr gerard and i talking but you can see us kind of gesturing and talking about philosophy in this gorgeous um residence and about some of some of the in my opinion the most important ideas in the world about logic it was just this kind of a beautiful amazing surreal moment that that even happened it's absurd to think that that happened just by sending out some emails and having this project to be invited out to do something like that and actually but that conversation was interesting because we spoke for at least another hour off air about the liar's paradox and i will tell you the conclusions of that conversation but he didn't want it uh, recorded and it was very illustrative so I learned a lot in that. It was a cool episode. I, I recommend everybody check it out. But that, just the, the fact that that happened was shocking. Okay, even the funnier and, and more absurd story for this to happen to some guy on the internet who started up a podcast and then wound, wound up in Oxford. This is when I was talking with Timothy Williamson, who's the most prestigious logician in the world. After we get done talking, it was a great interview, He's like, oh, hey, do you want to go to lunch? And I'm like, of course I want to go to lunch. So I guess in Oxford, it turns out there's this, uh, th th it's laid out such that they have this like inner sanctum area that's cordoned off to for the very sophisticated people. And so we go into it and it's beautiful, you know, well-maintained lawns and everything. And we're talking about Zeno's paradoxes. I'm telling him how he's wrong about Zeno's paradoxes because, you know, infinity. <laughs> and uh, so we get there and we get like into the dining hall and... And this other absurd moment where there's a butler 
Uh, this is a this is a British butler, so like they do it right in Britain, right? That's where they have real butlers. And he's got a little you know cloth over his arm, and he's serving me sautéed mushrooms in the inner sanctum of Oxford while I'm having this conversation with uh, Timothy Williamson. He's like, "Would you like some more mushrooms?" Uh, and I'm like, "Yeah, they're tasty. That'd be great." So I mean, you step back and you look at it and how absurd that is, and where, you know, the show started off, I don't know, I don't know how long I was even into the show. That was pretty early on into the, even the show. It was like probably not even a year, maybe, maybe a year into it. And wound up building a good connection with Dr. Williamson, where we're having this absurd, sophisticated thing happen um, that I would never in a million years have predicted was in the future just because of the show. So I hope you guys hear that. I'm not, I'm not trying to brag. I mean, that's, that's pretty damn cool. I'm proud that that happened. It's an awesome story. But just be aware, if you do this in a sincere way and you have a podcast or whatever your project is and people know that you're sincere and you can find a way to communicate effectively, you have no idea what doors will be opened and what kind of absurd opportunities will pre pre present themselves. Um, as a result of you pursuing your passion. I know it's smarmy, but uh, I could just personally attest to that being the case. And now from here on out, because I've built these connections and, and I, I think it, I, I definitely, if I choose to, know that I can have a fulfilling and financially successful career indefinitely in the world of ideas outside of the academy. That is the case. It's just a matter of how I want to do it if I want to do it. So... So I hope I really hope you guys um, find that encouraging, and of course, part, that's partly thanks to to you, whoever's listening right now. You know your support, either financial support or you know you sharing this with people that makes these kind of opportunities possible. So I'm I'm just deeply grateful for that. I should probably also mention what should be obvious that uh, there are difficulties in doing a project like this. It's definitely not all sunshine and roses. Um, I think the hardest part for me, especially when I was traveling, was tr trying to commit to a con consistent production schedule, especially with the health issues. Because if, you if you're a driven person and you feel like, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to produce this, and people have the expectation this is going to happen and this is going to happen, and then you have a couple bad days and you're behind and you work too much and you get stressed out and it's not good for your health, it's just a bad circumstance. And I know for a fact now, after the fact, that... Some of the traveling that we did, while it was cool and it was a cool opportunity, it 100% clearly harmed our health, which, you know, uh, is probably not a trade-off most, most people should be making. So um, I, one of the reasons I really have uh, enjoyed being able to have Patreon is because er, early on I changed from a monthly subscription to a kind of per content subscription so that people are only getting charged when I produce things. That has just reduced my stress level so much because I don't feel nearly the amount of pressure to produce things because people are giving me money. So if I, if I have to wait two months before I produce another piece of content, which has happened several times now, it, it sucks. I don't like it. It still stresses me out a little bit, but I don't feel like people are sitting there just, you know, get to throwing their money away at some content provider that isn't actually providing content. So, so uh, shout out to Patreon for having a cool setup. And also a much bigger shout out to uh, my assistant who has been helping me both with the, the audio production and with proofwriting stuff. Uh, his name is Justin Pratt. He's awesome. Um, we've kind of developed a friendship, and I really enjoy his company. We've had a bunch of great philosophical conversations. But especially when I was traveling, I really, for a, some period of time there, I was definitely overloaded. <laughs> and uh, so I put out, I put out the call. I said, "Hey, look, if you, if anybody wants to work with me on this project, let me know, and I've got some work for you." And Justin emailed me, and it's just been an amazing setup. Um, he's just been a, a reliable dude, and you know, thanks, brother. I really appreciate all, all of your help. All right. So that's kind of the stuff I wanted to talk about on the, the retrospective 100th um, episode of Patterson of Pursuit. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I don't intend to self-indulge in this way in the future. Maybe episode 200, I'll do something similar. But um, yeah, I also have some cool uh, interviews coming up in the future. I'm just going to have, a, as a general rule, I don't have a production schedule. And until 
health is completely sorted and career stuff is completely sorted, I just, you know, I, I put too much pressure on myself to try to consistently produce. It's not good for my health and it causes too much stress. And I know you guys don't really care. I, could, I know people that are, are producing stuff overestimate uh, how important things are for their audience. So um, I, I'm just going to say, you know, whenever the episodes get produced, that's when they get produced, and I hope they continue to create value for you guys. All right, thanks for listening. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day.